Hello and welcome to the Perpetuity Art podcast series. Perpetuity Art Training is part of the Lynx International Group, offering traditional classroom, distance and online training programs in security management. We have worked with our trainers to put together a range of short 15 to 30 minute presentations on specific aspects of security management, which we hope you will find both interesting and informative. Our aim is to provide you with practical, relevant and engaging learning that has a positive impact on you and the role you have in the security environment. After engaging with our presentations, you may be interested in our extensive range of distance and online packages. For more information, visit our website, www.perpetuityarc.com. Enjoy the presentation. Hello, my name is Angus Starrett Warren. I am Group Director responsible for security consulting at the Lynx International Group. I'm also part of the training team at Perpetuity Arc Training. So today I just want to talk to you about facilitating effective security. Now the purpose of this uh, short presentation is to give information to those that might not be involved in the security sphere, who, but who have been given uh, security responsibilities. So they need to perhaps have an understanding of how to go about doing security. And when I say doing security, uh, it's a huge, huge topic. So this is just merely a, an overview of, of the kind of considerations you need to have in place. So facilitating effective security. So first question is, in reality, is what are we talk about when we talk about security? And also one other thought process comes in, what is the difference between, for, for example, security and safety? So let's just pause and think. So what is safety? What do you think safety is actually all about? Well, let's just pick a, a random definition. So safety, the state of being safe, exemption from hurt or injury, freedom from danger, so this kind of fits into all sorts of uh, management theories. For example, we can have hierarchy of needs. So we are managing to have our money. We're managing to have safety and security in terms of our life. And that's the basic needs of humanity. So what's the difference between safety and security? Well, security is the condition of being protected from or not exposed to danger. So if you are safe, you are free from danger. If you are secure, you are not exposed to danger. So if you think about it from an umbrella point of view, so we have health and safety and our welfare, and that is what we want to be existing in. But the umbrella, from my perspective, is the fact that you have security over the top of you. So security is allowing, facilitating the state of being safe and secure. However, and this is a bit weird, um, security isn't defined specifically in uh, legislation for example whereas health and safety is so just using the uk definition the duty of every employer is to ensure so far as is reasonably practicable the health safety and welfare at work of all employees so it's very obvious what has to happen we have to have health safety and welfare but can you find that in your legislation regarding specifically to security is it mandated anywhere a specific law or code of practice even where you have to have security. Seems a bit weird. But then if you break it down from a health and safety perspective, you know, everyone has to wear PPE at site, everyone has to have yellow high-vis jackets, they all have to have hard hats, they all have to have uh, the correct seat to sit in. Okay, but where does security come in for that? Security always seems to be the, uh, shall I say, the poor cousin of health and safety. But in reality, if we drill, drill down into it and think back to our definitions in terms of um, safety and security. Security is 100% fitting into the health and safety bracket. So without security, you can't assure the health, safety and welfare, welfare of employees or other site users. So you have to have security. So if you ever struggle trying to um, promote security, if you ever struggle trying to persuade, for example, a decision maker about to spend on security, then I would definitely pull out the health and safety card and use that as a way of indicating where security fits into day-to-day uh, -day life of employees and the workplace. So interesting things to think about. And now we're defining security. Now, Melinda is a fairly well-known academic in the world of security. And just to help you out here, we have a glorious equation. So security equals uh, the function of A, P, T, and then we have S, I. What on earth are you thinking about? Um, a bit early in the day, maybe even late in the day for an equation to be put in front of you. Okay, but let's just break it down. So security is um, the S, so security, fine, is a function of A, asset. So what is an asset? An asset is something of value to the business. 
something that is worth protecting. Um, so we could be talking about people. So people should always be our topmost asset. We should be thinking about protecting our people at all costs. Other assets we need to think about. So it could be tangible assets. It could be uh, product. It could be raw materials. It could be buildings, etc. And ideally, we would be working with other parts of the business. So security be looking at um, what they need to do and what assets are at core. But we need to be working with our, for example, business continuity planners to work out what might be the critical assets we're trying to protect as an organization. So that brings us to P, protection. So what are we protecting? How are we protecting? And we'll look at that a little bit later. And then we have T, T for threat. Now a threat, um, to keep it simple, is a man-made, just to keep it very simple, is a man-made um, adversary. So it could be a criminal of some sort, it could be a terrorist, it could be an internal um, member of staff, for example. So the insider threat, as undoubtedly you've all heard about, so threats come in various guises. So they could be external threats, they could be internal threats or a combination of two. Uh, so uh, we need to understand who is targeting our organization, who is targeting our assets, and we can then start to work our protection measures around um, their actions. We tend to look at the word hazard as meaning more uh, natural issues, such as earthquakes, floods, and dare I say it, pandemics. So understand the difference between threats and hazards and also how they fit into business continuity and other compliance parts of the organization. And then finally, we have the situation. Okay, what is actually happening at the current time? Now this will change, the situation will change depending on adversaries, the threat. It'll change upon business functions, business operations. It'll change for a variety of reasons. So you have to bring these situational context into place. So security is broken down, it's a function of asset protection, threat, and the situation. Now, I'm not gonna ask you to write copious notes on um, proving security or proving, um, et cetera, but that is just to give you an idea of what we're looking at in terms of security and how security professionals will start to look at um, the whole of the risk management process, the security risk management process. So security planning is the next piece. So we've uh, decided we understand what security is. Now, how do we go about doing security? Well, uh, strange as it may seem, planning is very important from a security perspective. Now, from a consultancy perspective, my experience is there is often a lot of um, security on our site, but it hasn't necessarily been planned well. So people have said, well, we need guards. Why do we need guards? Because everyone has guards. Why do we need CCTV? Everyone has CCTV, so we need CCTV. Okay, why do we need a fence? Well, we stop people coming onto our site who shouldn't be there. Okay, brilliant. How high should that fence be? I don't know. What does everyone else do? So let's put a six foot fence in because it's cheaper than an eight foot fence or a 2.4 meter, depending if you're imperial or metric. So security planning for me is one of the weakest parts uh, of, of a lot of organizations. We are getting better at it, but there is still a long way to go. So without going through every single stage here, but through from the beginning with engagement with stakeholders through to the actual review and monitoring process, there are specific steps we can look at. Now let's start with the first circle. So engage with stakeholders, and I have the, or the abbreviation OR there. And we'll look at that in the next slide, but an operational requirement. So for security components, we should be putting together basically a strategy document which identifies why we need that particular piece of uh, security equipment or people or procedure and how that fits in with all the other security mitigation aspects we're looking at. So again, like I said, we will look at that in the next slide. We also need to understand the risks to the business. So we have to conduct a risk analysis. So the risk will identify the assets, it will identify the threats, potentially the hazards, and if we go back to Mananta, the situation in which we're operating. So we then have a, uh, an asset register, which we can then look at the specific risks for each of those assets. And then moving through to our security policies and statements about what we're gonna do about security, what physically, how we're gonna go about um, delivering security and making sure that we have defined aims, objectives, and um, we have a return on security investment, for example. And then that will be fitted into our security plan. So we have a document, a uh, tangible evidence that we are, are doing security correctly. We have identified risks to our staff, we've identified risks to the business, 
and we are then planning and putting in place the measures to um, ensure that security is achieved at our site. And that will be through physical, technical and operational measures. Some might say it be through people, procedures and equipment, for example. And once we have that in place, we're then looking at reviewing and monitoring. So there's a continuous cycle, there's a continuous process of identifying uh, what is required. And this will change depending on threat profiles. It'll change because of perhaps budgeting. It might change because of uh, new uh, facilities and new workplaces, etc. So it is a cyclical process. And yes, I could have put another arrow in from review and monitor and back to, for example, risk analysis. But it's easier to make it using the... Uh, the slide availability from PowerPoint. So that gives you an idea of the kind of steps we, and we need to be able to demonstrate that. So if there was ever to be an incident and someone, God forbid, was to be injured, then we can actually say, well, that was outside of our parameters. We had considered it, however, X, Y, and Z. So you are starting to be able to mitigate any potential litigation, et cetera. So security planning is key. And I mentioned to you about operational requirements. Now these are broken down into uh, level one and level two operational requirements. So the level one is a strategic overview. It's what is the problem we're trying to address? Okay, who needs to be involved? Now the stakeholder group could be security, health and safety, uh, human resource, operations, finance, legal. So it really depends. And then we also need to do our risk analysis, our risk assessment, and this will hopefully work in, in hand in glove with other departments, for example, business continuity and other compliance areas. So from this, we can start understanding what we're looking to do and we can understand the kind of options we have available to us on a strategic level. Now, keeping it very simple, the level two operational requirement drills down into um, more specific areas. So we're defining the problem more specifically. We're looking at potential operational issues. Operational issues could be quite straightforward. We're now gonna have a new gate or a new turnstile. So how many cars can get through that gate in one hour? How many people can walk through that turnstile in one hour? So if we have, for example, 5,000 people on staff, 5,000 people on site, and there's a shift changeover, is one the turnstile gonna allow people to go off site and on site for that shift changeover? Or are you gonna have queues snaking down the road? So we need to be thinking about operational issues and how that fits in with security requirements. And then in the system side of things. So it could be CCTV, it could be a detection system on your fence, it could be a detection system within your buildings. So what is the specifics of, what are you trying to do with that system? What does it need to be able to do for us? Um, so all of these things will be then starting to move in towards actually specifying the system itself. So actually that will then pass to integrators, to installers who will then actually be able to then perhaps make, depending on the the type of tender process might make recommendations in terms of how to achieve what is required from the level two operational requirement. And then there's a management side of things. So how are we gonna manage our new piece of technology? What is required in terms of, for example, maintenance programs? This all must be built into our uh, tender and procurement process in terms of security systems. So that's a very brief overview of operational requirements. It's a very useful, very easy process to follow. There are documents available from people like the uh, CPNI uh, and NAXA, various other organizations who can help. So if we go back to our stage, we're looking at identifying the problem. So think about the problem. Okay, what are we trying to achieve in terms of security? What is the problem we're faced? So, um, various ways of doing this. So you could conduct a security survey at the site. A security survey, sometimes called security risk assessments, will look at all of the uh, security measures in place. It will look at uh, what has been provided, uh, look at vulnerabilities. Uh, it will be thinking about other areas such as the deployment of people, the use of uh, technology, equipment, uh, policies, procedures to make security happen. Part of this will be the actual risk assessment, the risk analysis. So that will be looking at our threats, our assets and our vulnerabilities, and then where they co-join, that's where you have your risk. So as we said, threats could be internal or external. So externals could be robbers, terrorists, uh, children uh, creating graffiti, uh, arson, bored youths causing problems, breaking windows, whatever. So we'll have a, a range of issues from the threats we've identified. 
uh, the assets we talked about, so assets are adding a value to the business. So again, what must we protect? What are the key areas that must be protected? So for example, if we are reliant purely on um, a substation to provide electricity to a site, okay, we need to protect that. Um, and then we also need to consider things like backup generators and emergency power. So we can start to mitigate, not just through security, but through operational measures. And vulnerabilities. A vulnerability is an area of weakness that can be exploited by the threat. So it could be, for example, that we don't have um, a fence that is in good repair. So someone cannot easily walk over it, walk through it, climb through it, go under it, whatever. Or it could be that our operating procedures of our security team are not being enforced. So people are allowed onto site without having their credentials checked, for example. So we need to look at all these vulnerabilities. So we can do a security risk assessment, we can do our security survey, and we do our security risk analysis as part of that process. And as we start thinking about the different types of threats, so as we've been talking about, we've gone from here in the, 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 the slide, we've gone from trespassers through vandals, thieves, through to terrorists. So a very simplified way of looking thing, at things. So how do we mitigate the risk from trespassers? Well, we can put signage up, so do not enter. We can put a fence up. We can have patrols, for example. Now, again, we're not quite sure what trespassers are gonna do. They might just be looking to vandalize before um, for fun, because there's nothing else to do in the area uh, of where the organization is situated. So yes, a fence might uh, just actually mitigate that risk of vandalism. And as we move along the continuum, as things get slightly more risky, thieves, again, we might have a fence, but again, then we put in our barbed wire topping, 45 degree angle, etc. And obviously, high risk areas, uh, and also in major cities around the world now, we have to consider terrorism. So again, we will have our operational requirement process. We'll look at uh, the potential for attack from a terrorist group. So we then can think about, yes, we can have a fence. Yes, we can have um, the 45 degree outrigger, but we might then add in additional uh, barbed wire, razor wire, etc., barbed tape, put cameras in. We can also start to think about hostile vehicle mitigation. So all of these things will have come through from your operational requirement process. So as the threat uh, becomes more acute, then we can start putting in more measures to mitigate that whole issue. And we need to understand how the adversaries will get onto site. So it could be quite simple that they climb over the fence or the wall, or they dig under the wall, or they just break through the wall. So again, from our analysis, we'll understand that the wall is actually too low, or it's made out of uh, poor quality materials, so we have a vulnerability there. So if we're people are digging under our fence or under our wall, then we have to say to ourselves, right, how can we mitigate that risk? And that might go along into some form of protection system, whether it's a, a buried cable system, some sort of uh, fiber optic or other system to pick up people going under, through, over the fence line. We can also do it slightly more scientifically with things like fault tree analysis. Now, this is probably something that is not generally used, but it relies on understanding how security components fit in together with each other. So each layer has to be breached for you know, that. So without getting too complicated on it, um, you can get very scientific very quickly. You can also do a straightforward adversary path analysis. So you think as, as, if, as if you were the, the criminal or the adversary, how would I get into my asset? What are the, what are the vulnerabilities? Where will I break through, et cetera? So you can do that and you can do that in a number of ways. You can go from outside in or inside out and you can do lots of exercises where people try and get through your uh, defenses either by stealth or by uh, subterfuge in some way or by, for example, uh, hiding themselves in a vehicle as it drives through and it's not being searched. And we just need to understand basic, simple things, for example, um, the majority of uh, burglaries happen through doors and windows, strangely. So if we can protect doors and windows, then fine, we might be able to mitigate the risk of burglary. So we have to understand how things, how we're being attacked by, by our adversaries. And we can do, and this is not particularly uh, complex, but just bear with me while I try and explain. So here we have a, uh, sort of layout of a site. So on the left hand side you see um, a fence, you'll see some barbed wire, you'll see our adversary, the gentleman in red, um, 
and you'll see an outline of the building. So we have a building access door, we have room access, and then going through to our safe. In the safe is our critical asset, and it could be information, it could be gold bullion, it could be diamonds, or whatever it's going to be. Now, if you're a burglar, and you're trying to get to that critical asset, you have to go past our various security measures. So we have some barbed wire on the ground outside our fence line. We have the fence and we have uh, outriggers with some wire on it. And then we get to the building uh, access points and the room access, etc. So the burglar has to breach each of those to get to the critical asset. And what we do is we look at this from a task time. And I borrowed this from uh, Mary Lynn Garcia, who's written a number of very good books on security. So let's just take it. So, for example, to climb the fence or perhaps go under the fence, whatever, we just get a notional time of, of, of um, 0.1 of a minute in terms of getting through. Okay. Once they're through the fence or over or under whichever they've gone, they start running towards the building. So they run 80 feet and that will take them 0.3 of a minute to get there. So our combined time now, our cumulative time, is now 0.4 seconds. So then we also have. Uh, the time required to break through the building access door. We've got to then walk through to the room access door. We've got to cut the locks off, etc. Get into the room, get to the container, open the container somehow, gather whatever asset is they want out of there and make an escape. And we can put this together in terms of, for example, all of those times, cumulative times add up to three minutes. So what do we do from a security perspective? Well, okay, we need to understand what our response time is. So, okay, to have a response, we have to have detection. So if we don't have any detection, that burglar is free to go through the fence, over the fence, under the fence, through the building access, get into the critical asset, break into the safe and take the diamonds or the gold away with them. So we need to ensure that we have detection at some point. So ideally we want detection at or just outside the fence line, the perimeter. So as soon as that person comes on to and, and gets into our detection zone, the alarm goes off. It can be assessed by our security control room, and then we can dispatch people to go and intervene. So then we may need to make sure that um, if our only method of responding is from a security team based 20 miles away, we need to understand how much security we have to put in place in terms of our walls, our doors, and how much protection we have to put in place. If you've got an on-site security team that can respond within three minutes, that's fine. Um, but then we need to understand what we're trying to do. Are we trying to stop them getting to the safe? Are we trying to catch them on the way out? What is our, our, our strategy here? So ideally, we don't want them getting into our safe and our diamonds and our gold. So if we have a, a total task time for the burglar to get in to get out again is three minutes, we want to be thinking about, hang on, we want to stop them before they've actually got to the gold and the diamond. So let's think about where we're gonna stop them. Well, ideally, we would stop them at the, at the perimeter, uh, but again, that might not be feasible. So then how about on the building facade itself? So therefore, if we look at it, we've got 0.1 of a second to get over under a fence, and now we're getting to the door. So we've probably only got, from a community's point of view, we've got about a minute or two to get there. So. If we can't get there quickly, we then need to put a stronger door in place. We need to put stronger windows in place. So they take longer to breach. So it takes more time and effort to get through them. So doing this, what we can do is we put in place uh, methods which actually slow down the progress of that burglar before they get to the critical asset. So we look at, and to use another equation, the time of penetration is greater than the time of detection and the time of response. So what does that mean? Basically, we're getting our security team there before they've broken into our building. So we need to be thinking about the physical components, the physical protective capabilities of each uh, access point, doors, windows, and the walls themselves. So let's not get too bogged down in this, but it gives you an idea of, of, the, of the kind of planning that needs to be put in place. And you can help. So for example, there is uh, there are various standards out there around the world, but uh, one that can be used is the LPS1175, and it's just been revised. It's now issue 8.0. And this is all about, uh, for example, doors, windows, grills, which are have a security rating. So my advice would be to use products which have a security rating rather than just relying on a door, which seems to be quite sturdy. At least you know if you go through a certified product, then it has actually been tested to certain levels. So the issues 8.0 from LPS 1175 uh, uses a, a, um, 
uh, basically a coding system to let people know exactly um, the protective capability of that product, its intruder resistance, etc. Um, so here they use the letters A to H, and this is corresponds to the toolkit that is available to, for example, a burglar. So uh, ranging from, uh, for example, saws, bolt cutters, all the way through to um, oxyacetylene torches and um, other um, high-grade pieces of kit to try and break into a, a site. So we have that's part of our risk assessment. We need to understand what are the capabilities of our of our adversaries. So the threat level is also about is the toolkits, and then the second and the delay side of things is the time in minutes that um, is provided when that um, door or window is locked and is attacked, depending on which um, toolkit is used. So we have minutes one, three, five, ten, fifteen, or twenty in terms of product. So just to give you an idea, um, in terms of tool category B, B, and this is slightly historic in terms of what's there, but we can look at things like wire cutters, bolt cutters, knives, tape, screwdrivers, uh, nylon filament, um, door wedges, WD-40 uh, hooks, all sorts of things, through to power tools such as um, cable um, uh, drills, etc., monkey wrenches, and various bits and pieces. So that gives you an idea. So that's tool category B, which is not particularly sophisticated going on, but then as you work your way through C, D, E, F, G, and H, it gets completely more uh, complex uh, methodologies. Bear in mind that they still actually use um, or have access to all of the tools from A, B, and C, and D, etc. So it just gives you an idea of the type of tools that are being tested against these um, products. And then what you have is a security rating classification. So it gives you, um, for example, D20 will be the, uh, the toolkit users, toolkit D, don't forget, plus that also be the tools in A, B, and C, and that will give you a 20 minute um, rating on that product. So back to our adversary path analysis, if we want to be able to have a uh, protection against a burglar because we can only get our security team there in 18 minutes, then you might want to be considering um, 20 minute delay. And then we also have to think about, hang on, what tools might they have? So again, we need to understand whether the burglary uh, burglars are gonna bring on to site um, a screwdriver with them or whether they're gonna bring on oxyacetylene torches, for example. So let's not get too bogged down in it, but it just gives you an idea that you, if you're gonna be buying security products, there are ways of actually assessing and understanding um, what you need. So we then look at actually um, what we're going to put in place in terms of security. Now, I could have brought up an onion and talked about onion skins and what have you. But in essence, the, the key we're looking for here is layered security, defense in depth. We're looking at multiple layers of security, which people have to actually break through to get into your asset. So this diagram just is supposed to represent the perimeter, the building access, and the interior secure area. So as we approach on our roads into the perimeter, the question is, how do we get through the perimeter? What kind of um, gates do we have? How many gates do we have? Ideally, we only have one on a site, but obviously that might not be practical. So it could be two. Um, any more than that, you're starting to create vulnerabilities for yourself because of the um, requirements to have uh, more people going through, more security guards, etc., and the potential for um, uh, unauthorized access increases. So as we approach up to the perimeter, we also need to be thinking about things like hostile vehicle mitigation. We don't want to be allowing um, potentially dangerous vehicles coming onto site and being checked on site. So again, depending on the risk analysis, depending on the situation you find yourselves in, you were saying, well, no, we're gonna search vehicles and people outside of the perimeter, if that's feasible. We also need to think about where we're gonna put our parking areas. So you don't want to have all your staff car parks right next to your production facility because there is a potential there for insiders to take product and steal it. So ideally your car parking will be outside of any restricted areas. Now we do have to be concerned about parking areas from a health and safety perspective. But a lot of crimes do happen in car park areas. So again, we need to have a balance between the operational looking after our, our people as well as the security in terms of keeping vehicles away from our restricted zones. On our perimeter, we might want to be thinking about 
uh, signage, warning signage. We need to be thinking about vegetation, how are trees, how are bushes encroaching upon our on our perimeter. So if we have a 2.4 meter high fence, it's uh, potentially very useful to deter uh, adversaries coming onto site. But if they can climb up a tree and jump over your fence, then you have a vulnerability. So we need to be thinking about clear zones, for example, both internally and externally. Lighting, what kind of lighting we're we using. So we need to think of the application in terms of what we're using it for and the type of lighting itself. So the type of lighting, whether it's going to be um, high pressure sodium, low pressure sodium, metal halide, or potentially we can use LED, which is more common now than it was before and provides a good type of lighting in, in, in the majority of um, applications. So the perimeter is quite um, complex. Fencing, again, we were talking about fencing, height of the fence, what are the materials made out of the fence? Is it uh, prism mesh 358 or is it standard diamond mesh, whatever? So all of these things will have come from your operational requirement analysis. And as we move towards the building, we're gonna to have to say to ourselves, right, what is the building made out of? Is it made out of blast resistant material if it's in a high risk area? What are the windows made out of? What are the glazing options? What are the films on um, glazing to assist uh, to mitigate the blast? Uh, the doors, etc., cetera, um, all need to be considered from a protection capability. There's no point having uh, a very strong uh, door and then having weak windows. So what we're looking to do is make sure that all of our security is balanced across the perimeter and the building side. So therefore, um, if it has a security rating, the security rating ideally should be the same for all components. Also, we can think about our, our CCTV. <clears throat> CCTV will be used on the perimeter. It'll also be used um, on buildings. Again, CCTV deployment will have been decided through the operational requirement process. What do we want the camera to do? Is it to detect? Is it to recognize? Is it to identify people in certain areas? We also have to think about our access control system. Okay, so is it a proximity system, card readers? Is it tokens? Is it uh, is there a system um, at all? Sometimes people don't have systems. So again, from an operational requirement point of view, all of these considerations will have been put in place. So as we move into the building, we're going to have to think about security guards, uh, their role on the perimeter, on the building, and then as part of the access management process. Again, security guards, that will come under the operational requirement side of things. But again, we need to think about uh, their training, uh, their management, uh, are they compliant with assignment instructions? So there's quite a lot of, of work that needs to be put in place to ensure that security teams are effective and, and deployed well and ensuring that um, security risks are mitigated. And as we move into the secure area, we think we have the areas, for example, for our control rooms, our key assets, uh, it might be a vault, for example, and also we might have senior executives in a particular area. So again, depending on the risk analysis, we need to understand um, how we, for example, can protect the senior executives uh, and other members of staff in the event that the facility is attacked. Um, is there a way we can uh, evacuate, um, not just when under attack, but also from a fire point of view, etc. cetera. Um, control rooms, uh, nerve center, we need to be understanding um, where we're putting our control room. Uh, the control room should ideally should be centered on the site with these multiple layers of security around you. If you put your control room on the perimeter, it is vulnerable to attack. So this is just a, brew, uh, a broad overview of, of the layers that we need to put in place. And there's a lot more we can talk about here, but it gives you an idea that you have to plan all of your security and using the operational requirement process. There's quite a lot of work to do uh, you need to identify your assets, you need to identify your threats. And all of this pre-planning, this will f um, allow you to actually put in place an effective integrated security system. Uh, integrated in the sense of the multiple layers, not just on terms of technology. If you don't follow planning, if you don't uh, consider the slightly more, um, uh, the, the framework we've been talking about, things can go wrong. So. Here we have a glorious picture of someone who said, right, we need an access boom gate. Okay, fine, they put an access boom gate and people just drive around it. 
and something slightly closer to heart for me. This is uh, someone said, yes, we need to put a fence up. So they put a fence up um, only to demarcate the property itself. But then lo and behold, they hadn't considered the trees. So therefore we have a number of vulnerabilities. So getting it wrong, uh, A makes you look stupid, but B costs money. And the stupidity, um, people don't worry about too much, but the money is where they worry quite a lot. So we need to be planning our security. We need to be putting measures in place. We need to be understanding what security requires, requirements are. We need to be putting in place uh, security that is commensurate and proportionate to the identified risks and threats. And it's an ongoing process. Don't just do it once and then leave it. This needs to be reviewed. Security needs to be reviewed on an annual basis. And most definitely when there's been an incident and something's happened. So that was just a brief overview of uh, facilitating effective security. Um, feel free to make contact uh, and get through to us from uh, Um And I look forward to speaking to you. Take care.